All right, good morning. Uh, welcome to today's presentation, uh, ILM 310-303-EA, Organic Chemistry Part A. Uh, not a very long presentation today, uh, about 30-ish slides or so. We introduce you into organic chemistry, uh, carbon bonding, the carbon molecule, and how, how hydrocarbons are made, how hydrocarbons are named, and some characteristics of hydrocarbon that is related to uh, their molecular formula. So uh, it's actually a pretty interesting uh, subject today. So uh, for us, we will require a basic knowledge of organic chemistry in order to better understand how processes uh, work and how some analyzers work. And in oil and gas industry here in Alberta, uh, this ties in pretty uh, heavily with organic, uh, organic chemistry. So our objectives today, uh, describing carbon bonding, uh, describing carbon compounds and their molecular formulas, and then describing the hydrocarbon chain. So this one is not too bad. The next ILM builds on this one a little bit and gets a little bit more complicated, um, but this one shouldn't be too bad. So we start out talking about carbon bonding. Uh, organic chemistry is a study of compounds that contain carbon. The organic part of it comes from the fact that it's believed that all Carbon materials come from living things. Uh, chemists have not been able to reproduce carbon synthetically. Carbon uh, forms covalent bonds uh, with other carbon atoms and many other atoms. And if you remember, covalent bonds are the results of two atoms sharing electrons. And the result of this bonding uh, is a large number of organic compounds. We will illustrate this with Lewis dot diagrams and structural formulas. So a little bit of a refresher here. Lewis dot diagrams, again, if we were to look at uh, carbon with the uh, atomic number uh, six in group four, tells us that carbon has four valence electrons. Um, this means that carbon can form four different covalent bonds. And this is why the, almost everything is made out of carbon, is because it has these four valence electrons and it's so readily available to bond with other things. All the other atoms out there have different numbers of valence electrons, but if they've got one out there that they're willing to share, they can come in here and join up with the carbon um, valence electrons in order to make covalent bonds in a bunch of different compounds. So basically what we're going to be doing as we go through here is we're going to be looking at different hydrocarbon formulas like CH4 here, which is methane, the Lewis dot diagram, uh, for methane, as you can see, represented with the four individual carbon valence electrons here. And hydrogen, as you know, has one valence electron, so it ties in very nicely. Each one of those hydrogens binds a carbon and covalently bonds with it, making this CH4 or this methane molecule. We'll then get into doing some fancy uh, drawings used to represent different structural formulas. Uh, these are all the same. Same thing in representation, and the expectation is that you'll be able to uh, identify either one of these uh, images and be able to tell me what kind of a compound that is. So we start out first talking about carbon to carbon uh, covalent bonding as our first basic building block here. Um, in addition to bonding with other atoms, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, actually in the second ILM, carbon bonds with itself in three ways, and that's the the majority of this module is talking about how carbon bonds uh, with other carbons. So pretty easy, uh, it either bonds and single bonds as, as shown in diagram A where uh, one valence electron from each carbon joins together to create uh, a single carbon-carbon bond represented as we see here, double bonds where two of the valence electrons share between the two of them and we call that double bonding. And then the third possibility here is where three of carbon's valence electrons share with another carbon that has three valence electrons and creates a triple bond. The thing to look forward to as we go through all of these examples is that carbon has four valence electrons and it is always going to try to find a partner for those valence electrons. So um, depending on what's available, kind of affects the different bond types. So you'll see them represented as single bonds, double bonds, and triple bonds. And each of these, although they have the same number of carbons and the same uh, valence electrons, you'll see that as these bonds uh, double up, 
the availability for hydrogen decreases because one of the hydrogen bonds has to be given up in order for a carbon to make a double bond. Two hydrogens have to be given up on each side in order for a carbon to make a triple bond. And this changes the chemical uh, or the physical properties of a hydrocarbon as we go along. And that's kind of what we're looking at in this ILM. So structural formulas are a way that we can determine what a compound is. And we've looked at different types of uh, formulas before. So we're going to elaborate on molecular formulas, and then we're going to show you a bunch of different ways that uh, molecules can be drawn. So molecular formulas, if we recall uh, from a few lectures ago, tells us the number in each type of atom in a molecule. Uh, a formula of C4H10, for example, has four carbons and 10 hydrogen atoms. Uh, it doesn't tell you much about the type of bonds, though, although by the end of today's uh, lecture, you would be able to tell me what kind of bonds uh, are being made in a particular compound based on what is available, but that's down the road a little bit. Structural formulas show the types of bonds in organic compounds. Um, and these formulas can be used to indicate the reactivity of a compound. And that's really what it comes down to when we're talking about single bonds, double bonds, and triple bonds. Uh, it has an effect on the reactivity and that reactivity uh, does things to the physical properties uh, of a compound. So double and triple bonds, um, are more reactive than single bonds. That's a, an important statement for you to remember. And the reasoning behind it is this. Ethane here, for example, has a single bond, which means that all its valence electrons are, are occupied and it can't do anything more. If this bond were to break, I would end up with two CH4s and that would be the end of that. Ethene, on the other hand, uh, with the double bond. If I were to break one of these two bonds here, I could still have carbon to carbon connected, but then I would have an option for another hydrogen over here. So that's an indicator that there's a possibility for a reaction to happen. With a triple bond, same idea, except now I have three bonds over here, so I need one to hold the carbons together, and I theoretically could break that these other two bonds, and they could bond to something else. And it's this characteristic of the hydrocarbon chain that we're really focusing on today. So we're going to talk a little bit about the characteristics of this single bond, this double bond, and this triple bond, and they have names. So the names are uh, how we describe them and uh, are tied into the suffix uh, that we give to the compound. And for a single bond, the suffix is going to be ane. For a double bond, the suffix is going to be ene. And for a triple bond, the suffix is going to be ine. So if I had uh, one carbon, that um, means that we have something meth, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But if it was one carbon um, and it was single bonded, it would be methane. If it was one carbon double bonded, it would be methene. If it was one carbon triple bonded, it would be methine. Uh, we'll talk about this more as we go through this. So the nature of a carbon chain is kind of uh, kind of like this, and uh, it's a little bit of information to take in, but it's not uh, not too bad. When carbon bonds together, it can do a couple of different things. It can either join together in a straight chain, like we see here, carbon, 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 where the carbons uh, each will connect or the inner carbons will connect to two other carbons, so in a continuous chain. And then the other option is having a branch, what we call a branched hydrocarbon, where we will find some carbons that connect to uh, more than two other carbons. So this carbon, for example, is attached to this one, this one, and this one. So that's three different carbons. So it'll either be in a straight chain like this or some type of a branch chain. And the branch chains are, are pretty easy to identify by looking at them. To make life a little bit more complicated, uh, the reality of chemistry uh, is that these bonds, when they're made, happen at certain angles. And these angles uh, are kind of like architecture. Some of the angles are stronger than other angles. Some of them are weaker than other angles. And those characteristics come into play uh, in reactivity of, of how easy can these bonds be broken. Uh, we don't get into it very much, so I'm just mentioning this a little bit on page six here on 3D formulas a little bit, just so that we understand um, that the bonds aren't literally in a straight line like we saw in the previous diagram. They're not two-dimensional. They're actually three-dimensional, and the shape of the molecule actually does mean something, but not really to us in our context. 
We now look at something called a condensed structural formula. So if we were to take one of these uh, structure, structural formulas that we uh, identified earlier, we can simplify them. And, and it's kind of next level stuff and it's kind of a shortcut. I don't use it too much, um, but you may see things written this way. Um, but again, different ways to write it, but they're all the same. And if you're in doubt, just count the components at the end. So for example, here I have a, a structural formula for some type of hydrocarbon compound, and we're going to write it in a condensed structural formula here. And all we're doing is we're grouping together the individual carbon uh, chain components. And we'll learn more about these um, coming up in the next few slides. It has to do with the number of carbons and what we call them. But basically, we can group this carbon uh, and hydrogen combination together as C and three H's and write it as C and three H's. And that is bonded to this C with two H's represented here. And then this is bonded to another C, which is bonded to an H, which is represented here. And then that carbon is bonded each to a CH3 on each side. So it's just a different way uh, of writing it and um, just kind of back, background theory for you. But again, if you were to count all the hydrogens here, and all the carbons here, and all the hydrogens here, and all the carbons here, there would be the same number. Uh, unless, of course, it was an isotope, which we'll dabble into later as well. Okay, so this is all just about how chemistry guys like to draw things. Okay, now we have a 2D condensed structural formula. So this is uh, a model of 2-methylbutane, and by the end of the two ILMs, you'll be able to look at a picture and be able to give it a name similar to this. Or if I was to give you a name like this, you'd be able to uh, draw a simple uh, diagram. When I get you to draw them, they're going to be, uh, when, when you're drawing them, they're going to be simple structural formulas. Although I may give you uh, something like this and ask you to name it, when you're drawing it, it's generally going to be in a straight line with branches. We're not too concerned about the uh, angles here. <clears throat> Okay, so in a 2D uh, cons uh, construction formula here, um, you'll see uh, figure, B, figure B shows us the longest continuous chain uh, and the branch and tells us a little bit about how we get this, this name here. So this 2-methylbutane uh, name tells us a couple of things. First, it tells us um, that, it's a, that it's a butane, and there will be a slide here in a little bit. The but prefix is tied to the number of carbons. So there'll be a little table that tells us uh, if we have one carbon, two carbons, three carbons, four carbons, it gets a certain name. Uh, it goes methyl, ethyl, butyl, propyl, pentyl, hexyl, heptyl, octyl, nonyl, and decyl. So that'll be all the, the pre prefixes that you'll see here. The ane, again, will re relate to the type of bond, and the methyl will relate to any branch if there's a branch, and the two will tell you where on the longest chain that branch occurs. So a lot of information on this slide, but we'll get a lot more experience here with it. So when we're looking at the hydrocarbon chain, there's the condensed structural formula. Uh, here's closer to the way we look at it. But when we look at these carbon chains, what we're trying to do is identify the longest straight chain, which we call the parent chain. And then from that, we find branches off of it. So if you see here, I can go one, two, three, four carbons. That would be the longest chain or go one, two, three, four carbons. That would be the longest chain. And then I'm going to left with a branch. So in this case, whether I count up like this or down like this, this branch is still going to be on this carbon here. And if we count it from the shortest side, so one, two, that would be where the branch is. So this is two representing where that branch is. Methyl because it's one carbon in the branch. And if I continue to draw this, there would be a hydrogen here, a hydrogen here, and a hydrogen here, because carbons have to use all four of their valence electrons, one for the carbon, and then the other three are for the, this carbon over here. So one carbon with hydrogens is called methyl. If it's on the second carbon, it's called two methyl. If it's on the second carbon of a four carbon chain, that means it's two methyl butyl. And if all these bonds are single, it's 2-methylbutane. So a lot of information there, but that's ultimately what we're going to be doing uh, by the end of this ILM. One more little painful diagram here on 3D condensed structural formulas. Uh, this is a model that represents bond angles. Uh, it's yet another way of drawing a molecule. So if you can't do it in 3D, 
uh, they use these little shapes and symbols in order to tell us whether uh, this molecule is coming out towards you, uh, going away from you, or if it's in the same plane uh, of the paper. So the idea is that something like this uh, can represent something like this. These two molecules are not the same, but this is kind of the idea. These symbols are meant to represent these different angles uh, that they come out as. Not really anything here for us to, to worry about. Um, this is just theoretical background information for us. So let's get into uh, hydrocarbons now that we've kind of discussed all the different types of pictures that we could be facing. Okay, so hydrocarbons are compounds that contain hydrogen and carbon, at least at this point in time. Later on in the ILM, we're going to get into something called heteroatoms, which are any atoms other, any atoms other than carbon or hydrogen. Uh, and in our purposes, we generally will substitute a hydrogen um, or a carbon in the backbone of the chain, becoming something called a hydrocarbon derivative. But we're going to start out just addressing pretty simple um, carbon and hydrogen atoms, and then we'll look at what happens with some heteroatoms or atoms that are other than carbon or hydrogen that we put into one of these chains. All right, so uh, talk a little bit again about saturated and unsaturated hydrocarbons. We've, I've, I've shown you a little bit what this means a little bit, but we'll talk a little bit more about what it means. So carbon, as I said earlier, has four valence electrons. If, if each one bonds with a separate hydrogen, it is said to be saturated, meaning it can't take any more hydrogen atoms. All the bonds or all the valence electrons that carbon had have found partners in hydrogen and they've everyone's happy they're all completely bonded and it's called saturated meaning it can't do anything else if it's the case uh, as we're describing here uh, all of those bonds are single we get an ane suffix that's characteristic of a saturated hydrocarbon so it'll be an ane whether it's methane butane pentane propane whatever it is if the carbon only has three hydrogens bonded to it, that would mean that one of the bonds is also a double bond because all four carbon electrons must be used. So that spare electron uh, will find another carbon to bond with. Uh, it'll make a double bond and that changes the characteristics and the name to an ene because if it has a double bond, it will have the ene -E suffix. It also will uh, constituted as being an unsaturated hydrocarbon because we could theoretically break that second bond and add another hydrogen to it. And we'll talk about processes, uh, industrial processes that are used to do that. The last uh, possibility is if the carbon only has two hydrogens bonded to it. Uh, that would mean that uh, one of the bonds is going to be a triple, again, because all four electrons must be used. And if it has a triple bond, it's going to have the Y and E suffix or the ion suffix. And it is also going to be unsaturated because it has two available bonds that could be broken. Okay, so that's, the, that's a large part of this ILM is understanding these uh, characteristics. So we'll look at each of these uh, families. We call them families. So the ane family, the ene family, and the ion family. And that's, again, based on the bonds. So first is alkanes. Alkanes have all single bonds, four of them. They may be chains with branches, or they could be rings. And you'll see uh, rings uh, in other ones. So if we looked at this one here, this is an open chain cyclo. Uh, sorry, an open chain alkane uh, with one, two, three carbons in the main chain, and then it's got a branch, right? You find the, main, the longest chain, no matter how you count it, it could be one, two, three this way, one, two, three this way, one, two, three this way, it doesn't matter. The longest possibility is three. The prefix for three is prop, so this is going to be propane because it's all single bonds. It's going to have a branch on the side, if we have a branch on the side, it's, it's named according to the number of carbons. So this says one carbon, which means it's meth. And I'm going a little fast, but this will make sense later. And this branch is on the second carbon. Doesn't matter if I count from this carbon first, one, two, three, or if I count from here, one, oops, one, two, three. This is branch is still on number two. So this is gonna be called two methyl propane. That's the end goal of this ILM, is being able to look at that and come up with the name. This one over here, uh, because it's in a ring, gets a prefix called cyclo. 
because it's all single bonds, we know that it's an ane. And in this case, it has one, two, three, four, five, six. So this would be cyclohexane. So it sounds like a lot right now, but uh, in the end, you'll be able to do this like a wizard. Okay, next we look at the alkenes and the alkynes. Again, alkenes have one or more double carbon-carbon bond, and alkynes have one or more triple carbon-carbon bond. So again, ethane, eth is two, so two carbons tells us that it's eth. All single bonds tells us that it's ane, so this is ethane. If I were to break, uh, or if I were to make this a double bond here, I still have two carbons, so it's still eth, but I have a double bond, so now it's ethene. If I have a triple bond with two carbons, it's still eth, which represents two carbons, but it has a triple, so it's ethine. So it's really not that complicated, hopefully. Okay, alkenes can also form rings called cycloalkenes. So again, here's the similar example here. Uh, I got three, uh, three carbons in my longest chain. I've got a double bond here. This is uh, mislabeled, as you see here. This should be alkene. This should be alkene. This is a typo in the ILM. I'm just going to point that out to you here. So this would be a cycloalkene, and this would be uh, two methyl propene. Okay, so that's kind of how that works. So uh, classification of hydrocarbons, looking at the families that we talked about before, we do break them out into uh, families, and that has to do with the ratio of carbons to hydrogens. Uh, the ends you see in these formulas allows us to mathematically identify the hydrocarbon types. So if I was to give you a formula like C4H10, for example, you would be able to figure out which uh, group it fits into. If you plugged it into this formula, uh, it would tell you whether it's an ane, an ene, or an ine. Uh, so the general configuration here for an alkane is uh, CnH2 two n plus two. So whatever n is times two plus two. So six times two is 12 plus two is 14. That's the formula for an alkane. Again, only single bonds. Alkenes is going to be CnH two n. So two times six is 12. That tells us it's an alkene. Uh, you'll notice that if I take away two of these hydrogens, that means that the, the, that means that those hydrogens disappeared. That left up two valence electron, electrons for carbon, so they joined up into a double bond, and that's why we're now calling this an alkene. For an alkyne, it's uh, CnH2n minus two, uh, which means that we've broken two of those bonds, uh, so we have less hydrogens and more carbon bonds. Cycloalkanes uh, and cycloalkenes, again, represented uh, by a respective formula, and again, when it's cyclo, that means it's in a ring. If it's an ane, it's all single bonds. And if it's an ene, it could have uh, double bonds. It could have more than one double bond. So lots of information there. So that's how we classify them. Um, unless, of course, we have isomers. Um, this is a, a twist. We've talked about isomers before. Uh, again, isomers are compounds that have the same number and type of atoms, but are arranged differently. Uh, differences in the structural formations. <clears throat> so we look at C6H14, uh, which is hexane. It has five isomers, which all have the same molecular formula, C6H14, but it has five different shapes and five different chemical, I mean, sorry, physical properties. What the easiest way to identify an isomer is by counting the carbons and hydrogens. So if you were to go through all this, these are all isomers of hexane. They'll all have six carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six. And you can count all of these, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. All of them have six carbons. Um, they're all going to have 14 hydrogens. So three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Doesn't matter which one I pick. They're all going to have the same number of carbons and the same number of hydrogens. So if I gave you a group of four, for example, on a multiple choice test, and I said, which of the following is not an isomer of the others? All you really have to do is count the components. Okay. Um, again, the big thing about isomers is by changing the configuration structurally, we're changing the physical properties of the compound. Parent chain, again, is the longest possible.
possible chain that you can make. So in this case here, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. In this one here, it's one, two, three, four, five. It doesn't matter where you go, one, two, three, four, five. You'll see you, you number them. And these ones are all numbered. Uh, however you do it. You might be asking yourself, well, how do I number, how do I know if I number from uh, this side or do I number from this side? Where do I start? There's a couple of rules. You'll experience them as you go along. Um, but uh, first and main rule is um, if you have a branch or a double bond, you count from that side first. So if this branch here, for example, is way over here on the left, I'm going to count from over here. So one, two because I always want my branch or my bond number to represent the lowest possible number. If I did it from this side, one, two, three, four, this would become four methyl pentane. And if I did it from this side, it would be two methyl pentane. And we want the smallest number possible. Okay, uh, again, this one here, longest chain, five. Uh, this one's got a methyl on carbon number three, so this would be three methyl pentane. This one, the longest chain is four. So this is going to be a prefix for four, which is bute. It's all single bond, so it's going to be butane. I've got two branches, both occurring on number two. So this is going to be uh, two dimethyl butane. So it gets a little complicated, but by the end, you'll get this all figured out. Okay, a little bit more on isomers. I'm talking about the physical properties. Um, You'll see these are representations of the four chains uh, from the previous slide, and you'll see the boiling points have changed. So uh, our standard hexane, which is the top one with the chain of six, the longest parent chain of six, has this boiling point of about 70 degrees. Pentane, which is one shorter in the chain, has a lower boiling point. Another pentane uh, with a different branch has another low, lower boiling point. Uh, the butane, which is a shorter chain yet, has an even lower boiling point. So the key, key takeaway here is as the uh, parent chain gets longer, it has a higher boiling point. As the parent chain gets shorter, it has a lower boiling point. And that's important because when we refine hydrocarbons, uh, things like crude oil have very long parent chains and aren't worth very much. And through industrial refining processes, we can break long chains into smaller ones, which make components and, and compounds that are more valuable. Okay, so let's look at these hydrocarbon chains. Uh, we'll look at the three families here, uh, alkanes and cycloalkanes, alkenes and alkynes, and start putting these little pieces together. Okay, again, alkynes are only single carbon-carbon bonds. You must pay attention to the naming. The formula is as we saw in that table. And again, they can be either straight or branched. Okay, so here's, here's that table I was talking about with the prefixes. So one carbon, two carbons, three carbons, four carbons, five carbons, six carbons, seven carbons, eight carbons. These prefixes are tied to numbers. They will never change. So depending on the number of carbons you have, that's where you're going to get your prefix from. The ane is going to come from what type of bond it is. And in this case, ane represents a single bond. So methane has one carbon, CH4, one hydrogen for each of the four carbon uh, valence electrons. Ethane, two carbons. Propane, three carbons. Butanes, four carbons, okay? And again, these can be either straight or branched. So if I was to uh, look at the cycloalkanes again, Three of them in a circle, four of them in a circle, five of them in a circle, six of them in a circle. So three is propane, four is butane, five is pentane, six is hexane. Because they're in a circle, there's cyclo something ane, cyclo something ane, cyclo something ane. The common industry name for this family uh, is called naphthenes. Don't ask me why, but it is, and it's probably a test question. One of those little Cliff Clavin trivia moments. Okay, physical properties of alkanes. The density and boiling points are physical properties, and that's what we're talking about mostly when we're dealing with hydrocarbon uh, and hydrocarbon distillation and processes. As a carbon chain gets longer, its boiling point rises and its density increases. Think of propane, which is C3H8, which is a gas at room temperature, and octane, which is C8H18, which is a liquid 
at room temperature. So there's a general rule related to the number of carbons and its phase. If it has one to four carbons in the parent chain, it's probably a gas. If it has five to 20 carbons in the parent chain, it's probably a liquid. If it has above 20 carbons in the parent chain, it's probably a solid or pretty darn close to it. So when there is a relationship between the number of carbon atoms and at least two physical properties, in this case, boiling point and density, we call it a homologous series. And I'm not sure if I pronounced pronounce that right or not. Homologous series. Anyway, this is the case with straight chain alkanes uh, and density and boiling points. As the carbon chain gets longer, the boiling point goes up, as does the density. Okay, so as carbons go up, so does the boiling point and density. And, and that is uh, important to us as instrument guys in the oil and gas industry. What do we use alkanes for? If they're saturated, meaning the bonds are all made, they're relatively unreactive. Uh, in this state, they are called paraffins. Uh, in Latin, that means unreactive. And it also means basically wax. And you know that wax is fairly unreactive. They do make excellent uh, reactants, so for combustion reactions, so they are used as fuels, lubricants, hydraulic oils, solvents, and polymers. Uh, and you'll see examples of uh, what they're used for and what the properties of the different families are as we move through them. So we started off with the alkanes, then we'll talk about alkenes, and then we'll talk about the alkynes. Okay, the naming, uh, naming alkanes again here. So uh, lots of reinforcement coming up here, so you get this all figured out. So naming follows a spe specific nomenclature or a set of naming rules. And again, for single bonds, they're all going to end in ane, and then the prefix comes from the numbers of carbon. So it's probably in your best interest to memorize uh, meth, eth, pro, but, pent, hex, hep, oct, non, and dec. Uh, don't go past 10. Most of them kind of stay under six, but make sure that you understand them and how they work. So again, one carbon, two carbons, three carbons, four carbons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the formula for naming them, we get the parent name, which is based on the number of carbons. So meth, eth, pro, whatever it might be. And then the suffix, uh, which is related to the family or bond type. And in this case, single bonds mean ain. So six carbons, hex, single bonds, ain. Okay, so here's your fancy dancy little chart. Uh, it tells you all the uh, numbers to name references here uh, and the suffixes by bond type. So looking at uh, all, the, uh, all the single bonds here, all the anes. So methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane. Then once you memorize these, the only thing that's gonna change moving forward uh, is identifying the suffixes. Okay, uh, side chains. Before being added to a parent chain, we have to name the side chain. The good news is if you know how to name a parent chain, you'll know how to name the side chain. The only thing you have to remember is that if it's a side chain, we add YL to that name. So we name it as before with the number of carbons in the side chain. So if it's one carbon, it's going to be meth. But if it's a side chain, it's going to be methyl. If it has two carbons, it's going to be eth. But if it's a side chain, it's going to be ethyl. Okay, so here we have um, hexane, which is a continuous chain, a straight chain of six. So we know it's hex, and it's all single bonds. So it's hexane. This one, however, one, two, three, four, five carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six carbons. One, two, three, four, five carbons. So again, the longest possible chain is six. So it's going to be a hex. It's all single bonds. It's going to be an ane, but we have branches. This branch on the fourth carbon has one, so that's going to be a methyl. This branch on number three has two carbons, so it's going to be an ethyl. So a good way to do it is to circle your branches, count the two carbons, then you get your prefix, and then you're good to go. And then again, naming, uh, in this case here, it's going to be three ethyl, four, methyl, hexane, okay? If I was to count the other way, one, two, three, four, five, six, it would be three, methyl, four, ethyl, hexane. 
And you're going to say, well, why don't we name it that way compared to the other way? Because there's another tricky little rule in there. And that means if, if they would be the same, there's going to be one on three, there's going to be one on four, regardless of which way you went, you write it alphabetically. So there's lots of little details in the rules here, but don't worry, I'm, I'm not too, uh, I'm not too wound up on trying to trick you that badly. But again, you're trying to go for the lowest numbers in the naming here. Okay, so let's name a branched hydrocarbon here. Look at a couple of examples here. So here we have a parent chain with one, two, three, four. If I went this way, one, two, three, four. If I went straight across, one, two, three. If I went this way. So the longest chain, no matter what, is going to be four. So if it's four, I know it's going to be butte. I know it's all bonds, so I know it's going to be butte ane. Then I know I have a branch, so I circle a branch. It's got one carbon, so it's going to be methyl. I'm going to count from the lowest side, so one, two, or one, two, three. Well, two is smaller, so I'm going to call it two methyl butane. I hope you're following along. Um, that should be uh, considered a relatively simple example. Uh, this one here, uh, same idea. Find your longest chain. We'll go with we'll go with four, and you'll see that this one has has two branches. It has uh, well, it has three branches: a branch here, a branch here, and a branch here. So this is a methyl branch, this is a methyl branch, and this is a methyl branch. So this introduces another rule: I have two branches on the same carbon, and I have another branch on another carbon, but they're all the same branches. So in this case, this is going to be two, two, three, trimethyl, because there's three of them, butane. Okay, hope you figured out, I hope you can follow along with that. So this is on the second carbon, this is on the second carbon, this one's on the third carbon. So there's gonna be two, two, three, trimethyl butane. If they're all the same as these branches are, you group them together and name them by tri. I don't think we get any higher than try. Um, you're not going to see anything more complicated than you see in this presentation. So that's the kind of thing that you are uh, kind of looking for. So let's look at the rules. Okay, first, we're going to find the longest chain length and bond type for the root name. Then we're going to identify each side chain. Then we're going to num number the carbons from left to right with an asterisk, meaning start left to right and count and then go right to left and count and make sure that you're getting the smallest possible combination of numbers, okay? Then those sides or the branches appear in alphabetical order, so not by carbons, but by alphabetical order. And then if some sides are in the same, uh, are the same group like we had in the last example, we group them together and call them di, tri, tetra, et cetera. So I could theoretically ask you all the way up to nine um, but I think most of them are following the first few categories here. Okay, so again, longest parent chain, one, two, three, four, five, tells us it's pent. It's all single bonds, so it tells us it's pent ane. We see that we have a branch, a branch, a branch. All three of branches are meth, uh, so methyl. And so it's going to be two, three, four, trimethyl pentane. Little tricky, little less tricky. Here's an example where I say number from the left, but it doesn't work. If I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, well, that tells me that it's hept or and single bonded, so it's going to be heptane, but it's also going to say that I have a methyl group here, a methyl group here, and then this one has two carbons, so it's an ethyl group. So I would have three, three dimethyl 4 ethyl heptane. If I did it the other way, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I would have 4 ethyl, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 ethyl, 5, 5 dimethyl. So 4, 5, and 5 is 14, whereas 3, 3, and 4 is 10. So I know I have to number this one from right to left. That's how you get around that problem. And then moving forward, um, nothing really changes except for identifying the bonds. So let's look at alkenes now and see how that works out. So we'll look at um, some facts about alkenes and then we'll look at some naming. 
So alkenes have at least one double carbon-carbon bond. The formula is as we saw before. A uh, common name in industry is called an olefin, wink, wink. Uh, straight chains are homologous with boiling point and density changing with the chain length. You'll see that through all of these. Uh, they are combustible, give off heat like the alkane family. Um, they have less than the maximum number of hydrogens because of that double bond, which means that they are unsaturated, which also means that they are more reactive than the single bonded alkanes. If we react them with hydrogen, we can turn them into saturated alkanes in a process known as hydrogenation, which we'll talk about in the second ILM. So here's an example of hydrogenation. We take ethene. How do I know it's ethene? Well, it's got two carbons, which is eth, and it's got a double bond, so that's ethene. If I react it with hydrogen, and this is a little bit ahead of ourselves, we break this bond, and when we do, it allows us to add these two hydrogens to it. You'll notice now it went from ethene to ethane. There's no more double bonds. That bond broke, which meant that each carbon can now pick up another hydrogen. So we went from unsaturated to saturated. Worth more money, worth less money. Okay, naming alkenes, all we have to do here is account for the double bond location in order to get the name right. Otherwise, it's all the same. The bond location is the smallest number possible, just as the branch was before, uh, and it goes after the suffix name. And there's a couple of different conventions for this. Um, in the ILM, they like to do it uh, one hexene, um, but I have seen it where you could do hex one ene. Uh, I don't care one way or the other, uh, as long as you've got the, the number representing where the bond location is here. So again, let's just, let's just look really quick at some basic examples. Two carbons tells us it's F. A double bond tells us that it's ene. Three carbons tells us it's prop. A double bond tells us it's ene. Four carbons tells us it's bute. A double bond tells us it's ene. And in this case, it's on one, two, the bond is on the second, so it's two butene. If I count it the other way, one, two, it's still on the second one, so it's still gonna be two butene. This one here is a little bit different. We have one, two, three, four, five carbons, which means it's gonna be a pent. It's got a double bond at least, so it's gonna be pentene. But I have two double bonds here. So I have one on one carbon, two carbons, three carbons, four carbons, so two, for pentadiene. This is a pretty complicated one. You probably won't see one uh, with double, double bonds, not very often anyway. Okay, so again, just looking at these real quickly again here. Number of carbons, where the bond is. So this is one hexene because the double is on the first carbon. This is two hexene because the double is on the second carbon, uh, not the one, two, three, fourth carbon. It's a one, two carbon. Remember, keep it small. Three hexene because it's on the third carbon. Here we have a methyl branch on the second carbon. So it's two methyl, one pentene because the double bond is on the first carbon. So branch first, two methyl, and then the bond, and then the parent name. So lots of little things to remember, but with you practicing this, uh, it's not bad. At the end of this slideshow, I, or at the end of this presentation, I put a link to a practice slideshow that should get you fully confident in all this naming. Okay, alkynes, uh, again, differentiated by the fact that they have at least one triple bond and a completely different formula. In the industry, they're commonly known as acetylene, and that should set off a couple of triggers. Uh, same physical properties as the previous families, meaning that the boiling points and uh, densities changes with chain length. Uh, mixing with oxygen creates very high temperatures, so think oxyacetylene. Uh, they have less than the maximum allowed hydrogens because of that triple bond, therefore they are classified as unsaturated. And they are also, as a result of being unsaturated, subject to those hydrogenation reactions where we can break those bonds and add hydrogens to them. Okay, naming alkynes, uh, simply find the longest chain with the triple bond, apply the same pre previous rules. So here, triple bond is on the first carbon, so it's hex one ene or one hexene. Either way, I don't care how you name it. Probably best to stick to the ILM. 
Um, but again, I don't care one way or the other. Uh, this one here again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, tells us that it is hept and that the bond is on three. And then I've got a branch here of methyl and a branch here of methyl. So it's going to be two, five, dimethyl, three, heptene or hept three or ein, sorry, my pronunciation's off. Okay, name your branches, find your bond, follow the rules, should be okay. Okay, mystery side chains. So all the examples we've talked about before, uh, previously have had hydrocarbon sides. There may be other sides like fries and salads. Boo. Some of the ones that you might see or all of the ones that you might see or the only ones that you will see include fluoro, chloro, bromo, iodo, and nitro, so represented by their uh, chemical symbols here, and simply put in the branch here. So what you have is a, a branch, bromine in a branch becomes bromo, fluorine in a branch becomes fluoro, chlorine in a branch becomes chloro. Another rule. So looking at this one here again, bond location trumps branch location when it comes to naming. So bond location here is on two, so it's going to be two on the longest chain, which is nine, and represents a triple bond, so that's going to be two non-nine, so that takes care of that. We have a branch on the four, which is chloro, so four chloro, chloro, and we have a branch on seven, which is a bromo, so seven bromo, because it's alphabetical, four chloro, two nonine. Wow, lots of different rules there. So again, practice makes perfect. I'm not going to try to make it very painful for you, um, but work through the exercises uh, and, and be sure that you do this because there's going to be lots of marks on exams based on naming hydrocarbons. So that is the end of part A. Uh, there's a link here to another PowerPoint that has a bunch of naming examples with the answers in it for, for practice. I encourage you to do that, especially if uh, you're a little bit at sea right now. Uh, going over this stuff. So I hope that worked out for you guys today. And that is the end of this lecture.